How many of you learned the Lord's Prayer growing up or recently? Anybody? All right, most. So if you're online or if you're in the room, I'd like for you to recite the Lord's Prayer. We'll do it out loud. Uh, whether you say debts or trespasses, however you learned it, we're going to recite it out loud. So on the count of three, we will recite the Lord's Prayer. And we'll do it with vim and and because it's the word of God. Way to go, Tyler. On the count of three. One, two, two and a half, three. Beautiful. Amen. Wonderful. So that's a pattern of prayer that Jesus taught us, some principles of prayer that Jesus taught us. Right after that prayer, though, what's often overlooked is that he gave us two pictures of prayer. And I want to focus today on those two pictures of prayer that help us more clearly understand the patterns of prayer. He gave us these two parables. The Greek word parabole, for those who like to dive a little deeper, P-A-R-A-B-O-L-E. Para means beside. Bole means to throw. And so a parable is to throw beside a picture, a principle. Or it is to give a story to support a statement. Jesus often taught in pictures and parables. So we have the prayer, this pattern of prayer, this set of principles that guide our communication and cooperation with God. But then Jesus says, here are two pictures that I want to look at here today. Luke 11, 5 through 13 reads like this. He also said to them, and remember this is right after Verses 1 through 4, the Lord's Prayer. Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. Then he will answer from inside and say, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't give up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't give, get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Second picture, what father among you, if his son asks for fish, will he give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. The Holy Spirit is representative of the best gift that God can give us. It's his presence with us while he is away. And if he gives us that best gift, he will certainly give us lesser gifts, is Jesus' point. So here are these pictures of prayer. So here's the sermon in a sentence. If flawed earthly parents know how to give their children good gifts, then trust that the flawless 
Heavenly Father knows how to bless us. That's the sermon in a sentence. And so here is the picture that Jesus shared, actually pictures. He says there are three friends in this parable. Friend A, friend B, friend C. You got that? Friend A, friend B, friend C. Friend A is at home. Um, a friend A comes from a long journey, knocks on friend B's door. Friend B is asleep. He gets up. And friend A asks for food, which was customary in that day to be hospitable. Friend B doesn't have any food, but he knows who does. He knows friend C has food. Friend A does not know friend C. Friend B knows friend A and friend C. Are you following me? So friend A, friend and friend so maybe if you grew up like I grew up, it may be easier to explain this as Larry, Curly, and Mo. Right, let's forget about that. So in actuality, here's what Jesus is saying. Friend A is us. Friend C is God the Father. Friend B is the mediator, the intercessor. That would be God the Son. We have a need. Friend A needs to go to friend B, the mediator, because friend A can never get to friend C on its own. We need a mediator, a go-between, an intercessor. And friend B connects friend A and friend C together. That's essentially what this picture is all about. Now notice, it's friend that's familiar. So here's the first thing that we have to keep in mind. Take and thank God for his familiar friendship or friendship familiarity. We have a friendship with God if we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and strive to practice the same. That's why he says when you pray, say our, it's relationship. It's a friendship. Every single person has been created by God and we're related to him in terms of creation, but not every single person has a personal relationship with him by regeneration. We call that being born again. Every person is in the earthly family. Not every person is in the kingdom family. And if I want to have assurance that my prayers are being heard, then I need to be connected as a friend in the family of God. So thank God for friendship familiarity. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples and thus us that prayer is all about a relationship. You can go to God as a father and as a friend. Secondly, this friend A went and asked friend B for bread. Bread is necessity. That's the second point. Take the time to ask God for necessities. That's bread, food, clothing, shelter, any other need that we have. Jesus is saying, take that need to God. And he did say the friend came and knocked at what time? Noonday? Midnight. That's a sense of urgency. He knocked at midnight. So take your sense of urgency and your necessity to God the Father. He wants to hear about those needs. So a friend of mine, familiarity, has come and asked for bread, which I do not have. That's necessity. And so can you give me three loaves for him? That is another entity. Notice that friend B was not concerned about himself. He was concerned for friend A. And so he went to friend C on behalf of another person, another entity. If I'm not careful, I will spend too much of my time praying to God for my own petitions or my own 
supplications. Nothing wrong with that. But Jesus is teaching us you ought to spend time praying for another entity as well, another person as well. So you have friendship, familiarity. Prayer is all about a relationship, communicating and cooperating with God. It's about giving him our necessities, even when they are urgent, even in our own eyes. It is about for praying for another entity, not just focused on myself. And then it is praying with persistency. Take to God your knees with persistency. I want you to hear me fast. I'm trying to get away from this so I can get to verse 11. So everything I'm giving you now is fast and quick and that's free. But when I get to verse 11, I need you to take your time and listen to me, all right? And so persistency. God tests the sincerity of our requests by often withholding from us what we want or when we think we want or need it. He is testing and purifying us in ways that we don't really realize at the time. But this friend kept knocking with persistency. And notice what Jesus says. The friend got up and gave him what he needed not because he was his friend, but because of his shameless boldness, his persistency. He got up and gave him everything that he needed. Now, here's the clue. Jesus gave this first picture as a contrast, not a compliment to the friend. In other words, this is a parable of contrast. Jesus is saying that if a fickle friend will give you what you need, how much more will a faithful father give you what you need? God is not like friend C. He is not like that person who only gives you what you want because of uh, you're bothering him or you're twisting his arm to make him do something he does not want to do. No, Jesus is teaching and saying, God wants to give you what you need. So ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking, and doors will be open to you. Don't ever get tired or discouraged from doing that. If you keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking with persistency, he will answer your prayers. You know what we think? We think I'm bothering God or I have a lack of faith if he doesn't give it to me and I have to keep on asking. No, it is a sign of faith, not a lack of faith, to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Prayer is a mystery, but it's a means of grace. Now, here's the, here's the last one. Then Eli will lead us in communion. Take a minute to trust that God knows what's best for us. Take a minute to trust that God knows what's best for us. Don't lose me now. Here's the second picture. What father, it could be a parent, mother, among you, that if your son or daughter ask you for bread, you would give him a stone? Did you hear Pastor Keith say that? Uh, we have to interpret the Bible in the time that it was written. Now notice it says, what son? A daughter. It's a child. What child? A child does not have the discerning ability of an adult, of a father, of a mother. A piece of bread in the ancient world was round, uh, similar shape and size like a stone. A child would not necessarily know the difference just based on sight. Or, he says, uh, what, what, what parent, if they ask for an egg, would give him a scorpion? Actually, it's a scorpion's egg. Those two eggs look alike. They're similar in shape. They're the hard shell outside. And a child would not necessarily know the difference. And one is edible. The other is poisonous. It takes a discerning father to know the difference between those similarly shaped eggs. Are you following me? And so a child sometimes can be deceived at first glance. A child other times um, 
will misread appearance. All of us are susceptible to misread appearances or to miss something at first glance. We need a discerning father to help us know the difference. So that's the picture Jesus is painting. If you as earthly parents can look and see the difference between what's good and what is best, how much more does your heavenly father know the difference between what's good and what is best? And so when I ask and pray and keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and he does not give me what I want or when I want it, I have to trust that he knows what's best for us. Because as a child, sometimes I misread stuff. Let me close with this. How many of you have ever been to jail? No, 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 don't answer that. Don't answer that. No, no, no. No. Don't answer that. I was driving down uh, my mid, late 20s, I-45 in Houston, Texas, and behind me was the Houston police with red lights flashing asking me to pull over. Well, I had people to see in places to go and things to do. I didn't have time to stop, but I did. And when I pulled over, the officer came to the door and he said, um, may I see your insurance and your license? And I said, sure. I said, officer, uh, may I ask why you stopped me? He said, because you have a warrant out for your arrest and you didn't make a court appearance. I said, no, I don't, I don't think so. He said, that's what the record says. So he took my license back, uh, came back and said, sir, step out the car. Do you not know that man had me step out the car, hooked me up, put me in the back of the squad car and took me to jail. And I was in jail for 28 hours. Now, pay your tickets. Now, um, <laughs> while in jail, I met a young man, an older man. Uh, he had been arrested for violating parole, and he was about to go and serve his five years uh, in prison, not jail. But we were talking uh, several hours that night, and he said, you know, you, you need to go talk to so-and-so, another pastor in the city. He told me that. And uh, so I did. I got out. I went to talk to this pastor, uh, went to his worship, uh, got on his schedule, made an appointment. He heard something about my life story, and he said this that I'll never forget till I die. He said... The kind of church that you want, God does not want for you. The kind of church that you want, God does not want for you. And it started me thinking about another kind of church. I wanted the kind of church that I grew up in and that I knew. But he said to me, that's not the kind of church I believe that God wants for you. It totally changed the trajectory of what I thought about church. And slowly but surely, God began to wrestle and change my mind about church. I got out 28 hours later. And when I got to the desk, the officer said, we made a mistake. You paid that after all. We're sorry. <laughs> you made a mistake. Or was it? Or was it? In hindsight, the father knew what was best. And for whatever reason, he couldn't get my attention another way. 
I missed at first glance. I misread appearances. I had prayed something that I wanted that I thought was good, but it took somebody else to say, that's not what God wants for you. And it happened in a place that I never would have thought or ended up. I never saw the man again. I'll look for him in eternity. But what was a mistake on the part of the legal system was a blessing to me because God knows what's best for us. Gracious God, our Father, as we come to the table, may we reflect on these two pictures. Thank you for being our Father, our friend, for having a familiarity with you. We pray that you would help us to recognize that we need a friend to go between us and God the Father. And that's who you are, friend B. And we thank you that we're not trying to twist your arm, force you to do what you don't want to do. You actually want us to come and to ask and to seek and to knock. So may we do that with urgency, persistency for another entity and trust that in the end, you know what's best for us. As we come to the table, may we reflect and express our gratitude for you guiding us and answering us, maybe not when we want it or how we want it, but as that which is best. In the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, even Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at HopeChurchMemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.